Penguin Netherland, as Mark mentioned. I am Penguin on the interwebs, anywhere that I can get it, which is most places. I blog at win.fm, playing only the hits. As Mark mentioned, I work at GitHub, more specifically on the API team. I help out Rick Olson, Rick Danger Olson. Uh, Jason Rudolph just started from Relevance, many of you know. Uh, pitching in on the API team. I do a fair amount of API support at GitHub. Uh, it's actually just one of the things that I was pleasantly surprised that I like to do. Um, I always thought that uh, support was uh, not too fun, having done it uh, in a couple of past lives in the, behind the corporate firewall, but that at GitHub it's actually quite fun to do API support. So if you've ever emailed into the uh, support at GitHub with API in the subject, it might be me you're talking to. I have a thing for dot .files in the last couple of years. Anybody have their dot .files up on GitHub? Cool. Anybody not know what dot .files are? A couple of hands. Cool. Dot .files are all those little dot prefix files in your home folder that configure all of your tools. Um, so they're how you customize your tool chain and kind of craft your own lightsaber. So Adam Yonke, Adam Waif. And I created dotfiles.github.com prior to me joining GitHub, actually. It's a guide if you want to look for dot file frameworks of how to organize your dot files. Adam and I use a topical framework. Instead of just putting everything in one big uh, flat folder, they're organized in folders by topic, so it makes it much easier to find your TMUG settings or your Vim settings, things of that sort. So other items about me. Uh, this is one of my turnoffs. If you can't find an RSS feed, I'm probably one of a half dozen users still in the world that use RSS. I've been known to care mad add a feed to your public open source blog if it does not have an RSS feed and I like the writing and I want to subscribe. Don't make me check back. Um, since obviously I have no hobbies, I write a lot of API wrappers. So um, when there's a new API out for some reason, for not so much anymore, it used to be every other Sunday, I was watching football and writing API wrappers for a number of, of APIs out there. It's kind of what got me the job at GitHub, is writing the OctoKit uh, wrapper. Um, GitHub uses that throughout a lot of our services. Uh, anybody see Boxin last week? So one of the first things that is required in Boxin is the OctoKit library to talk to the API to make sure uh, you are who you say you are. Um, when I joined GitHub, um, when they put you on the team page, you um, don't, you can't choose your own role. Somebody else has to give you a role, so this was my role, flightless waterfowl, uh, which, penguin. I am now de facto API evangelist, I think because nobody else wanted the job, and I like to talk, and I like APIs, so, but I am still penguin, most places. <laughs> That's one of my favorites. So, our industry loves buzzwords, as one of the earlier speakers uh, touched on today. So hopefully you didn't hear any of these lines last night at the drink up, but responsive websites are all the rage. Who's creating a responsive website these days? Cool. Your all the time. There you go. Nice database is a schema letter, so you say NoSQL or web scale, right? If you have an API, it's got to be hypermedia driven. And these are nice terms, but they're poor decision criteria. So I wouldn't weigh a technology choice based on any one of these single dimensions, but they seem to get a lot of the headlines. Um, so what the heck is hypermedia? Anybody not know what hypermedia is if I ask you to define it? Cool. Then this deck was worth the time. So one of the first things that you'd want to do is look it up on Wikipedia. Anybody running Hubot in their offices? I well, highly recommend it. Um, I can't get by without Hubot these days to help me out do the most menial, uh, menial task. Um, with your own personal task rabbit for most things. So Hubot and Wikipedia define hypermedia this way. Hypermedia is used as a logical expression of the term hypertext in which graphics, audio, video, plain text, and hyperlinks intertwine to create a generally nonlinear medium of information. Alrighty, so what's hypertext? 
Hypertext is text displayed on a computer display or other electronic device with references, hyperlinks, to other texts that the reader can immediately access, usually by a mouse click, key press, sequence, or by touching the screen. All right, what's a hyperlink? In computing a hyperlink or a link is a reference to data that the reader can directly follow or that is followed automatically. A hyperlink points to a whole document or to a specific element within a document. And quickly, you discover the problem with Wikipedia. <laughs> I'm sure we've all done this. Three hours later and you're, you forgot what, what you came there for. So there's a lot of terms around hypermedia, hypermedia APIs. One of them is this one. Anybody know how to pronounce it? Cheerios? Yes, rhymes with Cheerios. Which I think, uh, I mean, poor spelling could be made up with branding, so I think maybe uh, <laughs> something like that if it rhymes with Cheerios. If you can't see, that's a devil there in the, uh, the cereal box. So what is Hadios? Um, Hadios, I guess, can thought of, be thought of as the rest of rest. Um, anybody new to Rails like within the last three years? A lot of new folks. So go back and check the ancient tomes and see the whole REST uh, kerfuffle that we had a few years ago when uh, REST became the end thing to do with APIs. And then the HTTP nerd said, well, that's not exactly REST, and you don't use put and patch and all of that stuff. So anyway, this is the REST of REST. Um, a client enters the REST API through a single fixed URL. So there's a, an entry point to the API, a front door, if you will. All future actions from there are discovered within resource representation. So you get a resource back, and all the other future actions are discovered from those resources. And media types are used for the representation so that each resource representation has a media type that describes um, what goes into to each resource, and they're standardized around some schemas. Part of that is our link relations. So each resource has multiple links, relations to other resources that the API human or machine, uh, that's debatable, can navigate and go to uh, other parts of the API. So here's a most simple example. This is the GitHub status API, which we launched a few months ago. So now that you can check the status of GitHub and the GitHub API. So here's our front door, our single uh, fixed URL. It returns this representation, which is simply a JSON hash with three links in it. So each of these is a link relation. In this case, it's the status URL that I can then grab that. And I have the value to then follow with curl in a second call to get the data that I'm actually after. In this case, is the status. And I'm hopefully hoping that the GitHub's actually up right now, but this is a it was, you can see the timestamps when I actually prepared my slides. So status was good at this point. Brief detour, anybody seen JQ? That code example included JQ, a couple of hands. So I'm gonna share some of my uh, tips and tricks and tools of the trade as I go here. Uh, JQ is the real, oh, and don't do that by the way. On this like fireworks inside of a, a submarine while you're on the uh, conference Wi-Fi, wait till we get off that thing before you do a homebrew install, uh, since we're not going through a proxy server. Uh, but just brew install JQ. Uh, I think of it as the real jQuery. Uh, it'll let you walk JSON hashes from the command line. So consider this example. The URL up at the top is the uh, commits listing for a repository. In this case, it's, it's OctoKit. I can pipe that to JQ. The R switch in this case just tells it to return raw format instead of string delimited or quote delimited strings that you normally get back from a JSON API. And the second argument there, I guess the first option uh, argument is the uh, JSON, the JavaScript expression that we would use to walk that hash coming back. So dot, top level object, empty brackets means kind of an each iterator for every item in this array. I'm gonna call the author object dot URL property so we can grab all the URLs, and since it's Unix, and it's full of piping hot goodness, we can pipe that to unique and get all of the unique um, authors for that page of commits, which is pretty cool. Check it out. So hypermedia types, we go back to our hideous definition, that third bullet, uh, we talked about media types. Um, 
hypermedia type are my media types that contain native hyperlinking semantics that induce application flow, meaning they have links within them uh, inherently. For example, HTML is a hypermedia type because we have the, uh, the link tag, the A tag. Unfortunately, XML is not. Neither is JSON, for that matter. But HTML sucks for data. If you've ever tried to use HTML as a data container, we tried this once, it was called microformats. Anybody remember microformats? Cool. Yeah, let's put all of our data semantics in CSS, because that'll work. <laughs> so hypermedia types are my media types. If you've been around HTTP for any period of time, you know what a my media type is. And I had to throw that one in there. I don't even know where that joke came from at this point. But. So we can have hypermedia types or media types built on top of another media type that uh, in some cases add linking semantics if we need it. Uh, one of the most popular is HAL. So HAL, not this one. If it's over your head, then ask someone. <laughs> uh, HAL provides simple linking in data, and it comes in two flavors. But one of those is XML, so I really don't count that one. I'm kind of an XML hater. This is what HAL looks like. So in this JavaScript object that comes back, there's an underscore links hash that has all of these link relations. In the example I used with the GitHub status API, the single link was called status URL. Inherent in that was um, a link relation of type status. These can be made up here. Um, HAL provides a few, I guess, um, standardized relation types here. We have self, next, find, admin, and there's some other options for some of these. Uh, the thinking is that if we have standardized tooling around some of these hypermedia types, uh, we don't have to recreate the wheel every time we start consuming a media type and we're building tools around it like API explorers and, and things of that sort. Um, but then there's some folks at the far end of the spectrum that think we can just kind of build these automated machine learning type of systems where application, you write an application wrapper once and just organically the thing just keeps in sync with the server with it. I think that's sort of a pipe dream. Um, but it doesn't mean that we have to recreate the wheel every time that we expose a new media type from a server if we start using some of these standard uh, tools. But there's diminishing returns in some of these. HAL is one of the, the most simple uh, versions out there. Collection JSON is another one. I quoted Michael Munson earlier on the hypermedia types. Collection JSON uh, is one of his. Collection JSON is JSON based, and it's a read write hypermedia uh, type designed to support managing and querying documents. So it looks like this. Uh, in this, every object that comes back, the media type has this collection wrapper, and inside of there is a version, uh, an href, and then a links array like HAL had, an items array, queries array, template, and an error. Um, the Rails way when we're doing APIs, most of the time we're returning bare arrays, which is an easy way um, to just consume data, but we lose a lot of the metadata around that. Pagination is a good example of that, where if you're pulling back from a Rails API, you know, there's thousands of results, and you get the first page of that, there's really no way of knowing how many are in the full set. So you have to do crazy header tricks to kind of return that information, or you need to put the data down a level and have kind of a response envelope that has some metadata hanging off of it, and then an items collection, items array that you can then lop off. That seems to be a popular uh, approach, but in uh, out of the box, the Rails way is just to have bare arrays. This is quite an elegant format, but it gets complicated really quickly. Um, if you read the draft spec of this, uh, it's full of the typical spec language of must have, shall, not, all of that. Um, and I guess for me it has diminishing returns in how valuable it is to get your data into somebody else's format. Uh, anybody done any uh, shoehorning of your data inside of a, like an Atom format? Yeah, it's, uh, it's not fun times. I think Atom says it better than I could. Um, kind of the to boil his point down here, he wants to build things with an API, or expose things with an API, not spend his time uh, educating people in hypermedia. 
which just seems to be like what a lot of the hypermedia crowd does is talking about hypermedia and not really building anything. Um, so uh, the reason I, I wanted to talk about this today is because the GitHub API is often held up as kind of like the best real world hypermedia API that we've got outside of the dungeon chess game or whatever it is that Mike's created that um, you can hit that endpoint and kind of walk your way through this maze that, that he's created is kind of like the canonical hypermedia API. People look at our hypermedia URLs and they'll say, well, GitHub's doing it and I, I just want to kind of convey we're experimenting as we go for what makes sense. There's some drawbacks to a hypermedia API. There's some, uh, some big benefits. Um, but I want to kind of temper that with um, it's not all roses, it's not a silver bullet. Another quick detour while we're talking about specs. This is kind of high, Phil Bell. <clears throat> Anybody read a spec lately online? Nobody reads these things, I can't, this is, this is kind of my point. Um, this is what they look at, I and mean, it looked like this is one page and I think the thing that bugs me the most about all of these specs <laughs> is they're delivered in these little bite-sized chunks that now with you know, a 30-inch monitor, you get about four of these to a page and you're just paging down through all of these. And I, I don't know at what point people, if they ever printed these out and put them in a binder, but I don't think anybody's doing that anymore. I think we need to find a better format to deliver this information. Um, but specs are a pain to write. And, and all the media types really depend, the hypermedia types depend on this. Basically, your contract is your spec. Here's what goes into the type. And that's one reason why Mike, I guess, is big on HTML is because he, he feels the, the spec is the contract. And the API client developer looks at the spec to determine what should go into this HTML blob. So if you've ever returned data in HTML, or XML for that matter, everything comes back a string. And nothing aggravates me more than coming, seeing an XML array, or an array serialized in XML with a singular name on it that says type equals array. It just kind of bugs you. Um, whereas with JSON, you get arrays, you get primitive types just out of the box, right? Um, so depending on a format like HTML or XML that's not easily parsable, and you've got to add all the semantic on to it, puts the burden on the client developer to read a spec before he pokes on your API, right? So specs are a pain to write, they're also a pain to read. Nobody's got time for this stuff, right? And if that's your contract to consume an API, it's not curl friendly. Uh, if you've done any work with an OAuth library lately, hug whoever made that library, because they're a pain to write, a pain to test, uh, oftentimes a pain to use. That said, there's some cool ideas in the hypermedia world that I really like. Um, some of those involve specs, but they're, I guess, them down to the point where they're easy to, to grok. One of those is UI templates. Anybody use these? They look like this. So if you hit our um, entry point for the GitHub API now, we've got a growing list of all of the URLs that you can follow within the, the API the hypermedia types, because that's, that's the deal about a hypermedia URL, a hypermedia API. You follow links on resources, so everything's either got to follow the chain down four levels deep to get this resource, or you have these parameterized um, URLs that you can skip directly to what you want. So in this case, repository URL, this is the one that I think is the most prominent on GitHub. If you know somebody's username and the project name, you can get to the the GitHub project without having to go and search for it, right? So this is kind of just how our, our brains work around GitHub. This is a templatized, oops, wrong button. Uh, a templatized version of that, so the braces are placeholders for those parameters. So using the URI template gem, and you also can, I think, use uh, the addressable gem supports this to some degree now. Um, create a template object from this, passing it in a, a URL, and then expand that, passing it a hash of values, and it gets normalized out to that uh, full URL, which is pretty cool. But it also works with query string parameters. So you could have a parameter 
the keyword parameter just goes in the URL segment with an optional query string parameters after that. And the URI template library knows how to handle those, which is really cool. One of the things I think that's gonna have to happen for hypermedia to really catch on is this notion of hypermedia agents. Because right now, a lot of the, when people say, we need to build hyper, uh, APIs like hypermedia APIs because that's how the web works. They're making a big jump between how your browser works and how curl works or how this script that's automating some work works. Uh, the reason for that is your browser does a lot of smart things for you behind the, hoods, uh, behind the scenes with uh, conditional requests and um, caching being two big ones, following redirects is the third one, that just don't happen by default in scripts because someone's building a URL based on IDs that they know, they're making a call, they're expecting some output, they're parsing the results and they're, they're consuming it. Um, you need something a little higher level that when they're walking the, the links, you follow that front door from an API and you're following those resources you know, down the stack, you've gotta ask yourself, do I already have the front door, do I have this first level resource already so I can just consume it from cache instead of making another HTTP call. These are the types of things that uh, come into play when you're building any sort of performant uh, hypermedia uh, client. And a lot of these are built into to something called a hypermedia agent. One of these that I really like in the Ruby community is called Sawyer. Um, these are Springfield punks. I don't know if you've seen this blog, but um, I forget the, the guy's name, but he's created all of these popular characters uh, across all pop culture, but as if they were Simpsons characters. So he did a whole law series, which is just phenomenal. Uh, Rick Olson, Technoini at GitHub, has a whole lost theme uh, set of projects. Sawyer is the latest. It's a hypermedia agent. Uh, it's built on top of Faraday, which I lost that slide. Here it is. I'll go back. So there's Faraday. Uh, Faraday is, think of it as uh, a little bit broader based HTTP party if you use that one. A little bit more pluggable as far as transport agent and as a middleware stack, kind of like Rack that you can plug into it, which is really cool. Uh, we use an OctoKit and LinkedIn gem and some others. Um, this is what Sawyer looks like. Basically give it an endpoint, in this case something running on the local host. Uh, create a new agent, you call agent start, and that's just gonna find that root document and what every level of the stack in Sawyer does is essentially grabs the resource and it separates the data from the rails, the relations. And you've got kind of two buckets from that point on that and a response object sticks around as well so that you can consume the raw HTTP response codes if you need to. But you can then use the data. Every level of data then has a set of rails associated with that so you kind of walk the tree. Uh, in this case, calling Agent start would get a list of uh, resources that you could call. One of those is the user's URL. In this case, it's gonna call get on that. So just using dot notation, get, post, put, all the HTTP verbs, and then call data on that would give you the data for all of the users in this very simple case. So what I showed you earlier, and you've probably seen from the, the GitHub API, we've got kind of two flavors of the rels and the GitHub API. They get a status API, they're all the underscore URL variety. There's no uh, relation type hanging off of, there's no, it's not a hash, it's just a name value pair. Um, that permeates most of the GitHub API. We do have some of the HAL style link hashes uh, on the pull requests and some of the newer uh, resource endpoints, but we haven't, we made the decision we're gonna stick with the underscore URL in the next version of the API, kind of deprecate that links hash just because we weren't finding enough use out of it in the way that we were using it to kind of justify the overhead of the way we were serializing the JSON for that. Um, Sawyer out of the box looked at HAL style resources, grabbed that links hash, and that's how it separated. It knew data from links, right? Just look for underscore links, lop that off. That was your links hash, and then the rest of it's data, which is pretty easy to follow. So on a branch in OctoKit, I'm creating a hypermedia version of OctoKit that consumes the hypermedia features we're putting into the GitHub API. Um, but since Sawyer only knew about the links hash style, the HAL style, 
it needed to follow all those underscore URLs. So we just built a real quick and dirty simple parser that will look at the underscore URL version and lop those off, put them in the link hash that, um, that Sawyer expects, and then everything works from there. I've been really tickled with uh, the progress on that thing, but it's, it's one of those projects where you're building a, you're driving across a bridge as you're building it, straddling a, a few projects. We're extending the API, extending Sawyer, and extending Octokit at the same time. And this is the, the full batch of losties. We'll, uh, we'll get plenty of room to, to throw some more lost themed projects. Rick's created an um, organization now called Lost Island on GitHub. We're throwing Faraday. I moved to my Faraday middleware project up there. So um, if you have any uh, Faraday themed projects, the more the merrier. Just ping us and drop them on that, that org now. So regarding hypermedia, I throw this this graph into almost every talk of mine now. I, and I don't set out to do it. It just seems like to find its way back uh, into it. So and this one's kind of meta because we're talking about the Gartner hype cycle. Uh, this is hypermedia, so it's kind of the Gartner hypermedia cycle. Anybody not familiar with, with this? Essentially what it, what it says is there's a technology trigger, there's some sort of new technology, new whiz bang, uh, something that makes it the top of hacker news, right? Um, actually, even before that, Hacker News would be this next step. Something, somebody does a blog post and it blows somebody's mind and they start hacking on it at a hack night or something. Um, works up this slope up to it, makes it to the top of, uh, of Hacker News, right? We get this peak of inflated expectations. Uh, and then something like a web scale video comes out and suddenly you're in this trough of disillusionment, right? This thing you sold your manager on that you're going to use is going to save the world is now kind of the laughing stock of the community. And then once that dies down, there's this slope of enlightenment. And maybe it's not all that it was cracked up to be, but we have found uses for it in certain areas of, uh, of the company. We can plug this in. It's going to be a good tool. And then it kind of levels out of this plateau of productivity. I'm not sure where we are with hypermedia on this, this scale. Uh, we either are heading into that trough or coming out of the trough. Um, it's neither a silver bullet, nor is it... Um, something that should be avoided. I think the takeaway um, to sum up DHH recently is, you know, be a chap, use links, but don't be dogmatic about it. Um, there are some drawbacks to that, so I kind of want to talk for the next little bit that I have left, the next 12 minutes or so, is some API real talk. And I've, all of the memes that we use at work have blurred between what's a GitHub meme and what's like a Internet at large meme. So I don't know, is real talk a thing or is that just something GitHubers say to each other? No, it's a real okay, cool. All right. So anytime puts anybody anytime someone puts real talk at our campfire, it, it plays this clip, real talk. Um, and it's like throughout the day it just it, the things just lighten up my sound, I have to mute it. Um, but I think there's something good in talking about APIs and taking off the rose colored glasses for a minute. And just looking at an honest look at, at your API if you're building one. Who's building an API, by the way? I meant to ask that earlier. Cool. Who's built a wrapper for said API? Cool. The first thing is your API is hypomedia. So if hyper means high, hypo means low, right? You probably aren't using media types as much as you should. Let me do a quick demo, kind of show what we're doing with this with GitHub. I got new software updates. Lovely. Let's see if I can throw this on the second screen. Can you guys see that? Yeah. Cool. So if I, and I'm going to use something called GR curl, which is just curl pipe through GRC for color. So if you're interested, just check my blog. There's an um, article on GRC to colorize all the things. So if I grab a, a pull request real quick, uh, see if I can remember the, the uh, API URL here. I believe it's number 80. There we go. I made it big so you can see it, but it, things scroll really quickly. Uh, this is a JSON representation of a pull request. We actually have... Um, the ability to hit a README 
Let me hit uh, defuncts.js because it's easier to type here. Um, in the API, you can hit a readme resource. .js, that's the repo, yeah, cool. So I can type slash readme, and I'm sure you guys can unbase 64 that in your head to see what the readme says, right? <laughs> so this is one of those things where you do a JSON API and you're doing binary files that you know things get encoded, but what you really want is the raw format of that. So I can pass uh, the accept header, pass a different media, uh, different MIME type in this case, application, uh, D&D, GitHub, so vendor GitHub, raw, I believe. Yeah, there we go, that's the raw markdown. Same resource, notice it wasn't an extra query string parameter, the output type equals this, some bastardization of the query string parameter, it's just a different accept header, right? Um, we kind of take this for granted in Rails with adding the .json and things like that, but most of this really belongs in the accept header because that's what those format strings are doing for you anyway. Uh, raw, I can type HTML, and we render that. We even have a markdown endpoint, in case you didn't know. You can pass it any markdown and have it render HTML on the fly, and even pass it, if you want the GitHub flavored markdown that, that linkifies all of the project issue shorthand, you just pass it a project name, and that uh, argument, it will uh, render it as if it were markdown in that project, which is really cool. Now, these are pretty simple examples of just MIME types, raw HTML, and by default it was JSON. Um, but we've done some other things in the GitHub API, which I thought were really cool, unique cases of this. So this is the JSON representation of this pull request. But we also support this one, which is really cool. Uh, oops, except. So if you want a diff of that pull request, just pass the diff media type. Also patch, which I thought was really cool. Just different media types to power the same resource. Jump back over to Keynote. Another hard truth about APIs is developers don't read your docs. So one of the simple use cases for hypermedia is uh, don't build URLs, I guess, is the, the mantra of hypermedia. Use the URLs that the server returns. But there's something in, inherently intrinsic or innate about pagination that any developer, when he sees a list of something, will just intuitively start adding page equal blah, per page equal blah, and just hope something comes back, which works in most cases. That's how most of our resources for the GitHub API uh, are paginated, except for our commits, which our commits have to uh, paginate via a SHA that's a cursor, because we're going back through Git history. We have no idea how many pages it's going to be because it's just the way Git works, right? So we throw the pagination links in the link response header. It's a, a spec. Um, it's a blessed way to do that, but in our docs, we're pretty plain about that. You know, don't, when you're doing pagination, don't build your own URLs. Take the ones that the server gives to you. And so many help requests during the week of, you know, I'm asking for page 42 and it's not coming back with, with anything. So no matter how good you are explaining up front why your server does something the way it does, you're going to have the PHP script kitty that's not going to read it and start banging on it. Um, something else you're probably not doing is dog fooding it. Um, if you want your API to be successful, build something meaningful with it. Uh, realize the value that you're providing to other people and don't shoot for this uh, persona out there that you think is going to be consuming your API, uh, but build something meaningful with it yourself. At GitHub, we use the GitHub API to build Janky, which is our CI server, which is Hubot on top of Jenkins. Uh, Heaven, which is our deployment server, uh, our monitors app. So we've got uh, screens around the office plus iPads throughout the world that are secondary displays with whatever metrics that we want to follow. Uh, our team applications, our internal Twitter, uh, our hire application, which is how we hire candidates and filter candidates. The setup, which is now Boxing, that should update this slide. Uh, Boxing that came out last week. Uh, the graph store, which is graphite, but with a really slick design interface on top of it. So within uh, Campfire, 
we have all these small uh, graph commands that we can see metrics on just about anything that we want to do. All of this use, uses the GitHub API in some aspect. So how we use the API, uh, authorization, or authentication, auth n, authorization, alt z, uh, merging. So heaven actually uses the API to merge your pull request. So when I say deploy my branch to production, heaven goes out and says, okay, is master in this branch? If not, I'm gonna merge it in. And once it goes green, it throws it out into production. If it doesn't go green, then it says, hey, you're red, I can't deploy that. Commit status, which we launched not too long ago. Anybody using Travis CI or similar service with there? Cool, yeah. We use it internally with Jenky, but uh, Travis uses the same API to have your code built, and it updates the pull request with the, the build status and GitHub flavored markdown um, the native apps are using that as well. Another real truth of API talk, um, documentation aside, developers don't even like respond to your server responses how you intend them, even, even the most basic ones, right? So um, a server sends a 200, everything's hunky-dory, right? Developers get that one, right? So okay is okay. These are symbols at the bottom because that's how Rails uses them. 500 internal server error. The uh, API developer sees that and thinks, nope. 403 forbidden, no, nope. right? But the one that blows my mind, and this is kind of the one that hypermedia kind of hinges upon because if you're supposed to always return URLs and those URLs aren't supposed to change, <clears throat> excuse me, I mean the output types aren't supposed to change, which means you have to change the value of the URLs. Um, we should be able to handle 302s. And your browser does this all the time. And when we're browsing around, we don't even know that we're getting redirected. Every time you log into a website, every time you post a form in Rails, you're getting redirected, right? Just so that you don't get the post back message if you hit refresh the second time. For some reason, though, as API developers, we see a 302 and we just panic. I don't know what it is about API developers that will not follow a 302. They're like, I'm getting no data back. Well, did you check the location header and follow that? Oh. So what's a 302 again? Anybody have this Hubot plugin? I highly recommend it if you do any API work. You just say status code me, and it comes back with the HTTP status cats. Um, this is actually on GitHub, or uh, Heroku. It's HTTP status cats, just Google that, and it comes back with all of them, which is really cool. One more thing, uh, e-tags are cool, but nobody uses them. Anybody know what e-tags are? Your browser uses these all the time to see if content's fresh. In this case, we're calling uh, defuncts Chris Wanstra's GitHub profile. Uh, so we get that back. In this case, oops. Cache control policy is in the header. The e tag for this response is there. It's basically a fingerprint, a hash of that response type, a response. Um, so then when I make a follow up call, I can pass if none match back, parrot that back. And it comes back with a 304 modified. So it doesn't have to compute the payload and send it across. The wire doesn't do all that serialization. And on the GitHub API, we will actually uh, not count that against you on the rate limit if it's a 304. So if you pass that, that back to us so it cuts down, uh, it lets you get squeeze more of your, your rate limit out of GitHub. Whoops. Oh, we uh, also support if modified since, which I remember where I was going with this slide. If modified since is basically a timestamp version of that. So if you know the time, but not necessarily the fingerprint, you can use that as well. Uh, last case here that kind of is the, um, the other Achilles heel of hypermedia, uh, in my mind, there's this constant tension in, in API world of how much to give back in one request. HTTP requests are expensive. Payloads are kind of cheap. Uh, but N plus one over HTTP is, is very expensive, it's, it, it's, you get around it in Rails by an active record, include the association, right? You pull that back in one shot, you don't have to worry about doing the, the N plus one query thing, but in HTTP, this gets to be expensive, there's this trade-off. Uh, for instance, a lot of our listing views are actually hitting Git, so we give you just, just as much as you need to kind of go get that in a second call if you need it, because going to, the, to Git every time, 100 times on a, on a page is really expensive. 
Um, so that's one uh, example of just any API design that you're, you're in that constant tension. Hypermedia makes this worse because now, as I mentioned earlier, if you, everything's got to go through that front door. You either have to parameterize every URL that, that you could hit and provide it in that front door and know what that, that link uh, relation is going to be, or you've got to live with walking the tree four or five levels deep to go grab that resource. And that's where if you don't have caching, it'll kill you if every time you want to get one request, you're making four or five, because that's how the don't break the URL path is specified uh, in the API. So it's kind of this, this trade-off uh, in using hypermedia. Wanted to give attribution to all the icons I used in the deck. These are on the Noun Project. Anybody seen the nounproject.com? Check it out if you need uh, monochrome uh, icons that are SVG. You can blow them up as big as you want. Uh, all of these were found on that website, which I am uh, really digging these days. And that's it. Thanks.